Welcome to everyone to our uh, week three of our catalysis webinar. I'm really looking forward to introducing our speaker today from Auburn University, Dr. Carrero. Um, my name is Lorian Schultz. We also have on here Corbin Fight. We're both from the American Vacuum Society at the University of Central Florida. And the way that this webinar is presented is we'll have a 30 to 45 minute lecture and anytime during the lecture, if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat box. And after the talk, I will read those questions to Dr. Carrero as many as we have time for. And I'm really looking forward again, as I said, to introduce our speaker. Carlos Carrero was born in Tovar, Venezuela. He received his master's degree in chemistry from the Universidad de Los Andes. After working in the Venezuelan oil company, Carlos moved to Berlin, Germany to pursue his graduate studies and received his PhD in natural science from the Technical University of Berlin, working under the supervision of Reinhard Shoemaker, co-supervised by Klaus Peter Dienz, and in collaboration with Robert Schlugel from Fritz Haber Institute and Israel Watts from Lehigh University. While he's pursued his graduate studies, Carlos was awarded to join the prestigious Berlin International Graduate School of Natural Science and Engineering. And following his completion of his PhD, he moved to Robert Schlogroup's research group at the Max Planck Institute for Chemical Energy Conversion, in Germany. Then Carlos returned to the American continent to continue his postdoctoral research working with I. Permans at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And in fall 2016, Carlos Jern joined the Department of Chemical Engineering at Auburn University as an assistant professor. Carlos's research focuses on implementing Ramon spectroscopy methods toward understanding material structure and chemical composition, combining spectroscopy approaches with material synthesis and chemical kinetic studies, Carrero's group's efforts to establish quantitative structure, reactivity, selectivity, stability relationships for the upgrading of natural gas using metal oxide and carbide catalysts. Over the course of his career, Cullis has authored and co-authored over 30 papers in high-impact peer-reviewed journals and acts as a co-inventor for three patents in the area of material science and heterogeneous catalysis. So today, Dr. Carrero will share a lecture on Ramon's spectrokinetic approach to gain insights on the uh, structure-reactivity relationship of supported metal oxide catalysts. So thank you again, Dr. Carrero. If you want to go ahead, I'll stop sharing whenever you're ready. Uh. Okay, let me first share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Yes, that's perfect. Awesome, so I mean, first of all, Lorreen, thank you very much for the invitation. Looking at the program and the lineup that you prepare for the catalysis area, it's a pleasure and honor for me to be part of this webinar series in catalysis. Uh, good afternoon, and I would say good morning to everyone because you are located in different parts in, of the world. And I hope everybody is doing well, given the circumstances and yeah, Today, I will share the research we are doing in Auburn on Raman spectrokinetics. Before to start, I want to highlight that uh, I didn't know how heterogeneous the audience is going to be, so I tried to go into very fundamental approach in certain slides, but also I will be very generic in, in other slides, basically to make sure that everybody's on the same page uh, when I try to explain any, uh, any concept or I use it uh, in a specific terminology. Um, because I also assume there are many students in the audience, audience I hope, and if you are not familiar with the Raman spectroscopy or Raman spectrokinetics and also catalysis itself, so I would be happy to make clear some uh, concepts for all of you. Um, uh, oh, what happened here? It doesn't... Oh, okay. So, uh, before to start with, I'll show my data and what we are doing. First of all, I want to acknowledge my group, of course, the group of students that work really hard at our university is a mixture of graduates and undergrad students um, and all of them in one way or another has been involved in the Raman spectrokinetic approach. I do kinetics as well, I do materials preparations, we do different things in our group, but Raman spectroscopy is one of our, um, our, our key techniques because it's something that I believe is very, uh, uh, versat it's a, it's a very versatile and powerful technique to advance and understand uh, catalysis. I want to highlight here that Reed Adams, the person that Lorraine had the, the, the chance to meet in one of the ACHC meetings, if I remember right, you told me. I want to thank Reed because it seems like he impressed you and he impressed you regarding what we do in our group and what we do in Auburn. And I'm really glad for that. And that's why I think was the connection established between us. And, and so I'm really thankful for that. 
Um, so in our research, as I said, we, we focus on materials preparation. Um, I'm just wondering, sorry, can I see the camera here somehow? Your I... um, if you press participants, perhaps, or if you pin your video. Okay, it's okay. I just, I cannot see myself and it's kind of weird. <laughs> okay, so, um, oh, now I cannot have it here. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so in our group, we work with, a, um, a, we are preparing some materials, mainly metal oxides, either as a catalyst or precursors, if I can, if you can read here. What I mean by that is I'm using metal oxides not only to test their reactivity towards certain reactions, also to use them as a precursor to form or to create, for instance, carbides, oxides, borides, nitrides, and so on, to also start to, uh, to, to try to understand how um, their reactivity is. Uh, also, we do a spectroscopy or characterization, many different characterization techniques, but we focus primarily on Raman spectroscopy, as I mentioned, and we combine this materials preparation and spectroscopy with a study on transient kinetic experiments in order to do what a lot of people in my community in area is trying to do, which is establish a structural reactivity relationships in catalysis. However, what I'm trying to do uh, is to establish quantitative structural reactivity relationships. And I want to say this quantitative in capital because um, uh, you will realize in the few slide, in the next few slides, what I'm, I, I, it's important for me to do it quantitatively rather than only qualitatively. And ideally is to combine all these information to then um, have a more uh, rational understanding and, and more rationally uh, um, develop the new generation of solid catalysts. This is, this is the final goal um, by combining all these techniques. In today's talk, I will speak about Raman spectrokinetics and what the fundamental driving this approach, how we came up with the idea and, and, and how we prove the concept seems to work, um, what it is, what we have done and what we can do with it. Um, because remember also, um, um, this is a, a, I call it like the homemade methodologies, right? We're still on the development. We work with very model catalysts and a very specific reaction, but now we have to expand our applications and, 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 and see if it continues working and, and so on. We're, we're doing that. And also I'm, I'm basically a junior faculty, right? So I would like to be more advanced on what we are doing, but we are going step by step reaching our goals in that regard. So before we start to explain what the Raman spectrokinetic is and what we are trying to do with this approach, um, let me share with you how I see catalysis and try to, to especially for the students out there, to, to, to give you a, a, a feeling or a taste of, of how we see the problems in, in heterogeneous catalysis and what, how, how we try to approach them, right? So when I see heterogeneous catalysis, I see it as, as, as a... Um, you know, by definition, heterogeneous catalysis is, is a process in which two different phases are involved. Normally, it's a solid phase and a fluid phase, and the fluid can be a liquid or a gas. This is what we, by definition, know about catalysis. But also, we have a mixture of organic and inorganic phase. Our solid is normally a catalyst. The, our catalyst is normally an inorganic solid, and our reactants are normally a, a fluid that is an organic fluid. A, normally, in, in, for example, what I do is normally in hydrocarbon. So it's also a mixture between organic and inorganic phase. And what we have been doing historically to understand or to realize or to determine that the catalyst is making its job is to measure in the chain of concentration of the reactants, how this chain, how the concentration of reactant chain as a function of time to measure all the kinetic parameters that we know how to do, right? And then if the reaction rate increases, we say, okay, our catalyst is accelerating the reactions and so on. And, and basically this, this is how we advance in catalysis in my view. Um, and so what I, we try to show here is, for instance, the interaction on the organic phase, which is methane in CO, right? It's called the dry reforming reaction, how it interacts with the catalyst. And basically, when this interaction takes place, uh, um, following the seven step of catalysis and so on, so we can see if the catalysis phenomenon is taking place, if the rate increases, basically. How, if the consumption of these reactions or formation of the products is faster without the catalyst, to put it very, very briefly and very, very, very simple. However, when we see from the inorganic part, when we see the catalyst itself, how this catalyst influences the changing rates of the organic phase, 
we, we lack a lot of information that in my view for many of the reactions. The community has been advancing remarkably in various reactions, but for many of the reactions, we still lack a quantitative measurement on the changes that the catalyst suffers or experiences while uh, it's interacting with the organic phase. And this is what I try to do with the Raman, appro Raman spectrokinetic approach to quantitatively measure the change of the inorganic part while interacting with the organic part. So what it means is if the organic part, we can quantitatively measure rates, will be nice if we not only qualitatively see the change on the structures, we also quantitatively can see how the change takes place. And this is what I try to do with the, with the Raman spectrokinetics. For the students, normally when they join my group and they don't know much about catalysis and they don't know much about Raman spectroscopy, I explain it in the following way. So I, I, I tell them the organic phase, when we see catalysis, we can see from the organic part and it's like a person in the middle of the ocean that is lost there having problems with food and so on, right? And he's seen a small island there with a person and he thinks all the problems are solved. He gets happy about it. And we can see also catalysis from the inorganic phase, which is the person in the middle of the ocean that is in the island and also lost. And he sees the person coming from the bow and he might believe that his problems are solved. But to, to, to how to say, to make the happy history or the end happy history and, and, and the end, the happy end in this history, um, we need something in between, right? And this is what I'm trying to do with the Raman spectrokinetics to, to see what happened in between to make this either easier or nicer uh, um, to understand, or sometimes why not even complicated, right? More complicated. And this is what I try to show with this cartoon over here to, to try to see if they can get the overall picture of the idea. Um, so also for students mainly, uh, I want to very quickly speak about the Raman evolution in catalysis because I would use the terminologies that I would show in this slide for the rest of the presentation. And if, if you are not really clear on what the differences between these definitions are, you might not follow very clearly what I'm trying to say. So um, what, what we do in catalysis, we prepare catalysts and we need to characterize it for most of the technique. We basically, what we do is we take the catalyst, put into the spectrometer or the tractometer or, or a microscope or, or whatever technique you want to use. And this catalyst normally is in contact with the air, it's in atmospheric conditions, uh, ambient conditions, sorry, and so on. So this might be helpful in certain cases to have an idea of the an idea on, on, on if the preparation methodology was correct or, or, or an idea on how the catalyst initially looks like. But normally, for most of the cases, it's not really useful information because this is not the structure of the catalyst that is really participating in the reaction. Because when you have a reactor, you don't have, the, the, the sample is not already, is not um, exposed to the environment anymore. So we, we take this catalyst, we, we, we focus a laser, on it, a laser on it, and we take a Raman spectro, we call it ambient Raman experiments, basically, which is atmospheric, uh, atmospheric pressure and, and, and room temperature and so on. But the sample is in contact with air, in contact with moisture, which means the sample might be humid a little bit or wet, even partially or totally oxidized, especially if we are talking about a metal catalyst. Uh, so if you support it to expose them to air, air, they're not going to be metallic anymore, for instance, right? So we have now either totally oxidized or partially oxidized example, or the moisture might coordinate with the uh, surface species and therefore the structure might change or certain features in the Raman might be silent because now the water is, is uh, um, how to say, blocking those vibrations to say it in a certain way. And therefore you cannot see them and you can might misunderstand or misinterpret the Raman spectrum that you're getting. So again, this is not the best approach in my view and many people agree with that, I'm sure. And therefore, the in-situ approach is more accurate in order to get insight from the structure of the catalyst when using Raman spectroscopy. Actually, we're using most of the technique. The in-situ approach is very useful. And what it does is basically we can isolate our sample and then we can control the environment, um, the environment basically. So which means we can control the atmosphere, we can dehydrate samples, we can partially oxidize or totally oxidize, we can partially reduce or totally reduce. We can heat up the sample up to thousands of degrees, depending on the cells. We developed cells in our group, by the way, as well. Uh, and we can, we can purchase cells for different companies. We also develop our own cells. We can increase pressure from atmospheric pressure to 12 bars and so on, depending on the reaction, depending on the applications. So it seems to be a very useful approach. But again, you get information from the structure of the catalyst. So you see how the change takes place under these certain conditions, but, but no more than that. You see that A transforming to B, but you don't have the rate of this transformation, for instance. So it's, 
you know that B is a final structure and B is the structure that goes into your reactor, but you don't know how B is formed from A and, and so on, which might be a very useful information as you can see in the next slides. And because this quantitative information uh, um, also cannot be easily linked to the kinetic information that we normally get from the, from, the, from the reactor to see if this is a real structure that is participating in the reaction. Um, uh, another approach has been developed that is called the operandum approach, which is basically the same that in C2, just that you couple analytics into this system, which means normally for what we do is a gas chromatograph or, 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 or mass spectrometer. And therefore you can in this, uh, let me see if you see, oh, I think I can put this here very quickly, pointer, laser here. Yes, we can see here the analytics to, to determine the change in concentration of reactants in the products. If you remember the previous cartoon, here we can quantify the organic, the transformation of the organic matter, right? And, 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 and here you can see the change of the inorganic or the solid, but in a qualitative way, not quantitative. So the operando allows me to measure at the same time change in the structure and how this change influences the kinetics of the organic matter, which is very useful information, very neat. But I thought, and, and, and I felt at, at that time when I was thinking about the idea on if we can have a methodology that allows me to get quantitative information from that size, that then you can link or match with the quantitative information from the organic part, I think you will have a better overview of the big picture of the whole loop of the catalysis of the whole um, catalytic cycle let's put it that way and that's why we came up with the Raman spectrokinetics um, so the term spectrokinetics is present in several publications dating back as early as 1952 so we didn't discover anything um, I must say sadly we have not discovered anything yet <laughs> but <laughs> so the term spectrokinetics came basically when people start to connect or to use um, uh, IR to measure reaction rates directly from the IR spectra. And the reason of that, I think, is because um, you can easily uh, assign vibration of the IRs to the chemical bonds, and especially for carbonyl groups, right? For, for molecules, when you have a C double bond house, a lot of people use IR to measure rates with that, with, with IR. Uh, a lot of people use IR to measure reaction rates for this kind of a species. And the reason is because if intensity of the IR signal decreases, means you are breaking this bond, and by definition, a chemical reaction is when you break and, and you break and form new bonds, right? So which means you break bonds and you're forming new bonds, you are, can measure the rate of this chemical reaction using IR. And again, this is for the organic part, right? You are, what you basically are doing is to replace it in the GC and MS and putting it and putting there an, an FTIR spectrometer and making kinetics as well. So whereas with the Raman spectrokinetic approach, what we try to do is to do exactly the same, but for the inorganic part for the solid, we want to see if we can get kinetic information directly from the Raman spectra. And this kinetic information is going to be the quantitative value, the quantitative data to uh, um, determine the rate of the transformation of the solid. So we define, and, and to start with this idea, we have to make a definition. I don't know if, I hope it's the most accurate we could came up at, at that time, and we defined the Raman spectrokinetics as a time result operando Raman methodology. I already told you what operando is in the previous slide, that's why it's important, the previous slide. We defined Raman spectrokinetics as a time result operando Raman methodology in which reaction rates are obtained directly from the Raman spectra. So in principle, we want to replace, uh, we don't need, right, the inorganic transformation, we don't need the, the GC and MS in principle, and with the Raman spectrokinetics, we can get the rates from the solid and then make a connection with the organic part if we understand the chemistry taking place, as you will see in the next slides. Um, to do that, we have to first develop or build up a setup. Um, I just want to highlight here that, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's just one unit in the whole setup that we need to do by ourselves, basically. The rest, you can buy it. So we, 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 we have a, a microscope, a Rama microscope, a Renishaw Rama microscope with a, with a counter technology. If you have questions about it, we can discuss at the end. But what I want to highlight here is that the Rama microscope, the reaction cell, and the mass spectrometer, those are devices that you just can buy. And this box over here is the one that we did by ourselves. And a lot of people thought when they visit my lab, they think they come together and they ask me for the price because we painted in orange and it seems like combined a little bit. 
and 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 the reason is orange because it's urban colors <laughs> and therefore people think they come together but no this is what we did thanks to help uh, to thanks to the our, our workshop in our department and so on so and basically what we have there is a several valve and tubings and and and, and multi pore valves and and connections and and, and all these kind of devices or fittings that allows me to basically do something that I call gas phase titration. So what we are trying to do with this box here is to control the concentration of gases that go into my system, which is not simple, I must say. It's really tricky to do that and very expensive, by the way. This box costs more money than the reactor setup itself. So when you have a reactor setup to make kinetics, it's cheaper, a homemade one, it's cheaper than when you do this box. And the reason is because you have to use, to work with very, very small volumes, very, uh, what I call fancy valve, let's put it that way, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and this allows me to accurately look, uh, uh, feed a known concentration of gases into my system, and therefore I can be accurate in my measurements of consumption of the gas to go into products and so on, and how this influences the Raman spectrum. So this is the box again that allows me to do the Raman spectrokinetics experiment. Um, uh, okay, this slide shouldn't be there. Sorry about that. Okay, now that we have this top, um, we decide to use metal oxide catalysts basically because we have expertise uh, um, preparing those catalysts. This is what I wore in my PhD, and of course there is plenty of room for discovery in these kind of materials, even though they has been studied forever. I think there are a lot of stuff we still don't know. There are still a uh, uh, potential um, application of these materials when you mix them, especially when we try to create something uh, that we call synergistic effects and, and, and see if we can tune those synergistic effects towards certain products. And this, this is one of the paths we are using or we're following in our research. And so far, locally, we're, it's working pretty well. So we, 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 that's why we decide metal oxides, just to make the long, long history short. And we start to use vanadium in a Yovian system because um, previous experiments and, and yeah, previous experiments show me the, the, potentiality, the, the potentiality of this solid for a specific reaction, which I will not talk about this here today. I just want to show, I want to highlight that the rationality behind using this material is not because the spectrokinetic approach itself. It's just I had the samples, they're working very well for something, let's characterize them, and luckily we start to get nice data. But uh, it doesn't obey that it's the only sample that works for Raman spectrokinetics, that there is something behind the sample that Raman spectrokinetics might be very useful for that. No, this is, this is not the reason, this is what I want to highlight. So we start with vanadium, niobium, and silica. So it's a mixture of two components supported on silica support, on, on silica oxide. And we try to change or vary the concentration of niobium, keeping constant the concentration of vanadium to, to, to how to say, decode the complexity, the complexity of the system. When you mix the stuff, become more complex and it's harder to see or determine who is doing what. That's why we decide to keep constant vanadium for this study and make change niobium and then we are right now working on we do the op opposites and see what happens. So how do we prepare those catalysts? We basically, first of all, we promote the silica with sodium. For people who are familiar with this area and support a metal oxide or submonolayer metal oxide catalyst, we know that uh, um, you might be aware that um, silica never was really good support to anchor or to disperse higher amount of metal oxides because you never could reach the theoretical monolayer coverage. So we have to promote those, this silica by using sodium. And by using sodium, we were able to increase or enhance the amount of metal oxides that you can put on the surface of silica and, and ensuring that you will have primarily two dimensional species and no particles at all. So this is, uh, I have here the reference for Somebody's interested about it. This is the discovery we did when I was a postdoc in Wisconsin, uh, working with Joe Grant and his, his Hermans. And, um, so we basically promote the silica and then we start to add niobium on the surface of the silica, different coverage and so on. And then we add the, the vanadium. Uh, and this is just a cartoon, but I want to show with this cartoon that all the species are molecularly dispersed and we don't have the presence or we don't want to have particles on the surface of silica. Um, 
These are the theoretical monolayer coverage. So ideally we have to be below 10 atoms per square nanometer. Therefore, we try to do the calculations that when you try to prepare the samples, you don't overcome this number. And basically all this uh, surface area and metal loadings using ICP and so on, chemical analysis, we can ensure that theoretically, theoretically, we are below the monolayer coverage for a series of binary systems, vanadium and silica, for a, uh, vanadium and silica, the first one, vanadium and silica niobium, for a series of niobium and silica, and then for the ternary system, when you mix vanadium and niobium, as I said, we keep constant vanadium and we change the loading of niobium and see what will happen to the reactivity and so on. But again, the idea of this slide here is to show you that we are below the, the, the theoretical monolayer coverage. This is for vanadium, this is for niobium. If you put them together, you never overcome even more than 50% or 60% of the monolayer. So theoretically, we should be, we are fine. And actually we are fine as we will see now experimentally, right? After you prepare the samples, we can, um, uh, we assume that we have a highly dispersed system. We do in situ Raman. Now we're talking about in situ Raman. Remember the differences in situ parando ambient and Raman spectrokinetics. So in situ Raman to characterize the system and ensure that we have primarily two dimensional vanadium oxide, two dimensional niobium oxide, and we don't have particles of, of on the, on the system at all. What I want to highlight here is, and that's why I try to explain that the sample that we decide to use not necessarily obeyed the, how to say, don't necessarily was select, it was not necessarily selected to develop the Raman spectrokinetic. It was, it was basically a coincidence, let's put it that way. And what I want to say by that is, all the species that I have on my system, we cannot see them with Raman. In orange, I highlight the vibrations that I can see by Raman. And that's why you can see here the vanadyl vibration, this orange vibration, the vanadyl is 1032. Is this vibration when you have a ternary system, for instance, vanadyl, niobium, and silica, 1032 for two dimensional vanadyl. This is a bulk material. This is B2O5 bulk. So the vanadyl should vibrate around 992. So we don't have vibration, we don't have bulk systems in these samples, as you can see. For instance, right, this is the niobium, which is around 990. 988 or something like that. So this is, you don't see here niobium particles neither. So the orange vibration is the one you can see by Raman, at least under the conditions we are testing these materials to perform the Raman spectrokinetics. And, and the blue ones, um, let me see if I have here the animation, no. So I, have, I should have an orange square here. And the blue ones is the samples we cannot see, at least under the conditions we are performing the experiments. So we are going to focus on the vanadium, on the oxidation and reduction of vanadium. This is what I want to highlight in this slide. Despite off, we can characterize and make sure that we have these persistence. We also, we also, oh, thank you. I think somebody helped me with that. <laughs> we also um, um, can, um, yes, thank you. We also can follow uh, niobium in, in other cases or in other, if we use in other conditions, as you will see at the end of the presentation. So after we have a highly dispersed system, we are sure we have two dimensional systems. We want to, before to apply our, our Raman spectrokinetics, we need something to compare, right? We need to make sure that whatever rate we get, whatever results or data we get with Raman spectrokinetics, we need some comparison to see if it makes sense at all because we can get any number anyway, right? So um, therefore we start to perform conventional, let's call it that, conventional experiments like TPR, reactivity data with those samples to get reaction rates or to get trends and then compare those rates and trends with our Raman spectrokinetics and see if, it, if we are in business basically. So we did TPR and we can see the reducibility for vanadium with uh, four vanadium non-niobium so the binary system vanadium and silica it, high, it has the it has the lowest reducibility and also the highest reactivity as you can see here so this is rate Okay, again, this is a TPR experiment to see the reducibility of the sample. This is reactivity experiments in isobutylene, isobutane ODH to produce isobutylene. So we are comparing reducibility with reactivity, which a lot of people do. And I have my concerns about that to do a direct comparison because this is a ball technique and catalysis is a surface technique. But for this specific catalyst, it's very accurate to combine TPR and, and reactivity because 
they are surface catalysts. So the, the molecule, the, uh, sorry, the, the active size that dispersed by nitrogen and iodine are on the surface of the catalyst. And that's why the trend, as you will see, matches very nicely, actually. So the lowest reducibility, the highest reactivity, and then when you add a little bit niobium, interestingly, the reducibility go to the highest temperature, it's harder to reduce, the reactivity is the worst. And then when you continue adding niobium, interestingly, the reducibility start to go back or start to decrease. As you can see here, when higher niobium loading, lower reducibility and the reactivity start to go back. If you see the trend of the TPR experiments and you see the trend with the reactivity experiments, it matches very nicely. And this was very interesting because we can prove that we can combine TPR reactivity as soon as we are talking about dispersed systems or supported metal oxide systems because it's not involved, silica is not suffering any reduction or nothing like that. That's why the, the trend matches. But also it's also important that we can prove a synergistic effect or an interaction between, somehow an interaction between the vanadium and niobium leading to this a specific trend because you will expect that if you increase niobium loading it will probably a linear decrease or a linear increasing rate but you can see the trend I have a it doesn't follow a linear trend which is very interesting so different trends in reactivity and reducibility as a function of niobium loading this is what i mean with this so after being sure, being sure that reactivity wise with, with with conventional means tell us that there is a, a, a synergistic or an interaction between niobium and, 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 and vanadium, we want to then apply our Rama spectrokinetic approach to see what we get from this, from the reactivity or kinetic point of view. So to do the Rama spectrokinetics, the experimental procedure basically, I will not go into details here, but primarily what is important is the last part here, which are the pulses. If you remember the definition, when I say a time result approach, time result means that we are pulsing our setup or our system, sorry, we're pulsing because we need to quench the reactivity to have enough time to take the Raman spectra. So this is the secret behind this, the approach, let's put it that way. And this can be done only if we pulse. Um, so the first part is something that we do with the Raman spectrokinetic approach, with the reaction setup to, before to do normal, normal kinetics. It's, some, it's always we do this methodology. The new part is the pulses at the end. So this is the initial part. You take the Raman spectra and you can see how the pulse, when you pulse known concentration of gases, you can see how the intensity of the vanadyl bond, in this case for vanadium, remember, vanadyl bond increases as a function of pulse. And with the mass spectrometer, you also can see how the concentration of the unreacted reactant goes into the detector as a function of pulse as well, or as a function of time. So when we combine this Raman behavior with this is what is basically Raman spectrokinetics. Um, this is a box that I just showed you to do that, but let me focus first with the mass spectrometer kinetic, which is a conventional kinetics. So, sorry, when we pulse, we use one of the valves to pulse and basically you pulse oxygen. So what it means is, sorry, let me go back here. We reduce the sample as you can see, and then we start to pulse oxygen to oxidize the sample. That is why here, the lowest intensity of the vanadyl bonds means highly reduced sample. And then you start to oxidize and the vanadyl increases. So which means you start to oxidize the sample or to reach a steady state or, or to reach the total oxidation of the sample, which means the vanadyl intensity is not going to change anymore or the oxygen consumption is not going to change anymore. So, so we can pulse oxygen and so oxygen goes out because now the oxygen is consumed by the sample. Ow, 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 ow. And as you can see here, it remain constant, it's total oxidation. So it doesn't matter if you continue adding oxygen, that no reaction is taking place anymore. And every pulse, because we have this nice box and we know the volume of our gas, we know how amount, we know the amount of, or, or we know the concentration of oxygen that we're putting in, in our system, we can determine how much concentration is big represents basically. And then if you pulse for every different sample, vanadium constant, and different niobium, we pulse the total oxygen consumption as a function of time, you can see the decay and the slope of the decay basically is the rate of consumption of oxygen. This is what we do, doesn't matter if it's oxygen, doesn't matter if it's hydrocarbon, no matter what reactant it is, this is how we normally measure kinetics either with a mass spectrometer or with a gas chromatograph. 
now. It's nothing new there. Just that I want to, with my own setup, with my own catalyst, and under my own conditions, measure reaction rates to compare. Uh, to compare. Um, this, right? Okay, this is not with me, I think, right? So uh, to compare um, uh, with the Raman spectrokinetic data. So if this is the pulses that I show you, the first plot before here, this is exactly the same. It just to more graphically show you what this slow means. The slow means this part of the plot, right? The unreacted oxygen that goes into the detector, which means the difference between the maximum intensity in this is the oxygen consumed. And therefore we can quantify how much oxygen is consumed, as you can see, as a function of time and measure the rate. Important to keep in mind, based on literature and based on our own experiments, vanadium or niobium reduces around, one, around 520. That's why our TPR experiment showed the reducibility of vanadium, you saw that. And niobium and silica doesn't reduce below 1,000 Celsius degree. And this was very interesting for us because we were expecting that if we have the same amount of niobium all the time, or sorry, of vanadium all the time, and niobium doesn't reduce at all, the, reduce, the reduction of the system shouldn't, al should, so after reducing the system, the amount of oxygen that you need to consume to reoxidize the vanadium should be very similar. Maybe not the same, but very similar. Why? Because niobium stayed plus five all the time. According to our own experiments, we did this experiment, and we found the same data in the literature, we, DTPR until 900 and nothing happened. So what we found is that every sample consumes different amount of oxygens. What it means is, it also proves the synergistic effect because what it means is, if you are keeping constant the vanadium content, what it means is that now you are reducing niobium as well because you are needing more oxygen to reoxidize. And the only way you need more oxygen is because you have more reduced sites. And those reduced sites are Going to be in Ayobia for was a nice experiment, also, or a nice insight that we want to prove also with Raman spectrokinetics. Um, so, that being said, we run the Raman spectrokinetic experiments, and here you can see all the samples vanadium without niobium, different, same vanadium content, different niobium content. The intensities represent the vanadyl vibration, and you can see all the samples have different trends just by eye. So if we, if we plot the vanadyl evolution as a function of time, we can get for every sample, we can get all these this kind of plots, for instance. And if you have the slope of this, uh, of, this, of this curve, you can determine the rate of the vanadyl evolution. It is important here to follow it. There's the next one. Oh, it's there. I put it at the end. Sorry about that. So we need to know a little bit the chemistry behind the, we need to know a little bit the reaction that is taking place before to perform the Raman spectrokinetics because to quantify the time of vibration that you're looking at in your Raman spectra, we need to know, we need to know how much reactant or moles are needed to form this vibration of this bond. Otherwise, otherwise it's going to be just empirical. Otherwise you have to uh, higher slope, uh, how to say, Higher slope, higher reducibility, lower slope, lower reducibility, but you cannot say more than that. You cannot quantify it only empirically. So that's why to determine the vanadyl evolution, we need to know how much oxygen you have put it in, and you need to know how much oxygen is needed to form the vanadyl bond. In a couple of slides, you will see how we did that. But for now, please, please believe me that we can measure the vanadyl evolution as a function of time and the slope represent the rate. And if I compare the rate that we obtained by Raman spectrokinetics, which are these ones, with the mass, so this is a rate from mass spectrometry. This is a rate from Raman spectrokinetics. And when we compare our rates with the Raman spectrokinetics, we found very interesting results, such as niobium, no niobium, only vanadium, 4% vanadium, zero niobium. The rate from Raman spectrokinetics matches or is very similar to the rate with Raman. Uh, with MS. So Raman spectrokinetics and MS, the rates are very similar when you have a binary system, when you don't have niobium. And this was very nice discovery or, or, or result because 
We are not expecting any synergistic effects. We are not expecting any complication, let's put it away, with this kind of system because it's only vanadium. The system has been very, very well studied. It's a system that we know that the TOF doesn't change as a function of coverage. We know a lot about these systems and therefore we weren't expect, expecting anything, anything weird there. So which means this proof that the vanadyl of vanadium, when you don't have niobium, oxidizes and reduces in the same way and both techniques allow me to measure this quantitatively. Whereas when you start to add niobium, you can see that the rates with the Raman spectrokinetics increases also with the MS and they are very different when do you compare. Let's say the last one, 5.5, 5.5, 6.9. And this was very nice finding as well because it was kind of hard for us to, to try to digest or understand at the beginning. But the reason is, this is also nice for the Raman spectrokinetics, is site specific. So with Raman spectrokinetics, we're looking at the vanadyl vibration. We are determining the rates of reduction or oxidation, in this case of the vanadyl vibration, for a dispersed system. So what it means is, if the niobium that now get reduced to is participating in the reaction, we might need to focus on the niobium and make the Raman spectrokinetics on that side. What it means is, in theory, we're working on that. In theory, when you couple on, or you add all the individual reaction rates for a specific size, it might be very similar to the overall react, re, reactivity that the catalyst chose. Because in this experiment, when you use MS, the catalysts have different metal, um, different optic size and different components, and the system or the reactants are getting in contact with all of them, and you measure the overall reaction rate at the end. Whereas Raman spectrokinetics allows me to measure the site-specific rates, which I think is very neat. And that's why it matches in, in the 4% vanadium zero niobium matches because all the size theoretically, and this results prove it, are the same. And that's why they show the same rate, which is very neat. Um, if you want to go into more details also, um, because of time, uh, on, 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 on this study, I um, invite you to, to, to check out this paper and feel free to send me an email and so on if you have any question on how uh, how we did it, if you want more details or what else if we can do and so on. I'm also happy to get whatever insight you have because remember we are developing this and uh, every technique of course has um, uh, room for improvement and we're working on that. Um, what can we done, can be done with this approach as well? And, and, and this is the next step on the last part of the presentation. Very briefly, I will go very quickly here because this data is um, right now, um, we're working on a publication for that. But very interestingly also we found if we take a, a careful look on this plot that I showed you before, we see that we have different slopes as a function of time, right? And so for the vanadium on silica with niobium, the slope is pretty much the same. What it means is, again, it proves that it doesn't matter uh, at what time you measure the rate, basically. Uh, no, 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 that. What it means is that because all the sites are the same, we are not expecting any change in oxidation states or, or nothing like that because all the sites are the same, so the reactivity should be very similar. Whereas when you add niobium, we might expect that certain vanadiums reduce to plus three, or certain vanadiums remain reduced to plus four, certain vanadium size remains as a plus five, and so on. So you have a, a mixture of different sites. And this, of course, made the history more complicated because the synergistic effects are going to be enhanced, right? If you have only plus five systems, you don't expect any synergistic effect because all of them are the same. If you have a mixture between vanadium three, four, and five, and it co combine it with but niobium five, four, and three, and all this on the same surface, you can imagine how complex the system can become and how interesting also at the same time. So what we came up with was, if these slopes are different, when you have different loadings of niobium, we, have, we might have different oxidation states, both niobium and, sil and vanadium, sorry, not silica, vanadium and niobium, different oxidation states, and these different slopes might represent the rate at which plus four go to plus five, plus three go to plus four, or plus three go to plus five, 
So we, we, we want to determine that. And for that, we are collaborating with Dr. Jose Rodriguez from Group Heaven, where he um, already performed. We have this data, we're analyzing this data right now, working on that, on determine, or, or, or he performed in situ experiments when he reduced in situ uh, um, or samples, and then he can see the oxidation state change and so on uh, um, um, for, for, for these samples where you change the Niobium loading. And then we pulse the oxygen, and then we will see if the oxidation change similarly as it happens with our Raman spectrokinetics, and we can maybe assign these reaction rates to this change in oxidation states, which will be very neat. So very important here, this is what I was to say before, it's important to know a little bit the chemistry happened there because the two ways that at least we see of the oxidation of vanadium from plus three and plus four to plus five. Remember that the plus five is the vanadyl vibration, this one here that we can see by Raman. We don't see plus three, we don't see plus four. So what it means is you can see both reactions use different stoichiometry. So the stoichiometry is very important for kinetics, right? Right. Uh, um, is to determine the conversion, how concentrations are connected with conversion. So, and therefore, because both reactions have different stoichiometry, it's important that we know which one is taking place or more probably is taking place in order to calculate accurately the evolution of the vanadyl vibration that I can show here, because actually it's a half basically, which means those rates will be a half different uh, um, if we use different reaction. And, we determined that this is a reaction that mostly is taking place because when we do the C2 Raman experiment, we see the formation of water coming out just without putting anything, just putting hydrogen, sorry, just putting oxygen in our system, we can see water coming out uh, into NMS. And that's why we um, uh, are following this reaction and this is the geometry to calculate the evolution of vanadyl. So what else are we doing or can we do? Um, interestingly, when we see the Raman spectra for the different samples when you have vanadium and Niobium coverage, we see that the vanadyl vibration doesn't change much, maybe slightly in this sample here, but it's pretty much the same all the time, but the shape changes. We see shoulders here, we see a different baselines and so on. So we did some treatment on, this, on, on the spectra by normalizing baseline and so on. And we deconvolute those spectra to see if we can get some vibrations that make sense, basically. And we were thinking first on collaborating. We still are doing that, looking for collaboration, for uh, uh, corroborating that our vibrations can be, uh, to corroborate with theory that our vibrations make sense or are real. But also, luckily, also we found all these vibrations in literature already. So I don't think we have, uh, it's not that uh, um, uh, unrealistic to have uh, these uh, vibrations obtained by the deconvolution of, spe of the spectra. So we have the niobyl bonds, vanadium, vanadyl bonds, and vanadyls, uh, hydro, uh, hydroxylized vanadyls. We have vanadyls on silica 2D. We have SOD. So all these colors represent different vibrations. What we are doing right now is, as I said, these numbers doesn't match because this is site specific. So this is a vanadyl, vanadyl double bond, double bond O, the vanadyl double bond O rates. So we want to see how the intensity of these signals to also vary it as a function of pulse and measure the rate of all these individual vibrations and see when I put them together, how close or far I go from the overall reaction rate. If it don't change much, means those sites, those sites are not participating. We might conclude that for instance, but we, we are working on that to see if this kind of approach helps us to understand better our, our multi-component system. We also can do very nicely uh, uh, a support effect, right? We have here, we prepare a series of vanadium and silica, alumina, zirconia, and iobium and titanium. We do in situ Raman experiments to make sure that we have this pair vanadium or all of them, and then we run um, uh, Raman spectrokinetic for all the loadings. So we see here one, two, and three percent of vanadium. We calculate the reaction rate for all of them using Raman spectrokinetics. So we can then determine the TOF of oxidation of the systems as a function of coverage. And we can see that remains pretty much constant. And this is, has been reported also when you do conventional kinetics using supported metal oxides that the turnover frequency doesn't change the, the, the rate much. 
the overall rate much. So this is uh, very neat. Um, we're working still on that as well, putting this data together. Uh, also, we uh, can study, uh, we can determine the activation energy of um, the oxidation of our solid. Again, we're talking only about the inorganic part. All this data easily can be obtained from the organic part, right? Using kinetics and kinetic approach and so on. We are doing exactly the same from the inorganic part and then try to link all this kinetic information, quantitative kinetic information with the organic part and see if it happens. So this is the activation energy of vanadium and silica on alumina, on iodine, silicon and titanium. So we can calculate the activation energy, the upper activation energy for oxidation, for alumina is the highest. Um, uh, we have obtained so far and so on doesn't change too much between silica, silicon, and niobium, and, and titanium is a bit higher. And it's interesting because alumina and titanium has been shown, has shown by very high reactivity for certain reactions uh, 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 for oxidative, uh, oxidative or hydrocarbons, oxidative hydrogenation of hydrocarbon and so on. So um, we can have this data and we'll try to see how we can explain uh, uh, the, in the, the observation of obtain it, obtain it from the organic part. We also did uh, um, reaction orders. We are trying basically, well, this is what we did with, to get all the kinetic parameters we can get uh, from the organic part, now from the inorganic part. So we, we can, we change the partial pressure of the oxidant or the oxygen, and we can determine the reaction, we can determine the reaction orders for vanadium and silica, vanadium alumina, zirconium, niobium, and titanium. And when we plot the reaction order for different supports, we can see different reaction orders and so on, which might also help us to understand that not only the vanadyl bond is involved in the reaction when you have uh, um, uh, uh, vanadium and niobium together. So uh, in conclusion, um, uh, for this approach, I just listed what is possible to do and no matter the system, I use vanadium at the beginning because it's very Raman active and very nice for Raman uh, to get Raman spectra very quickly. But now we're using different metals and it works. It demands more time, most of the cases, but it works. Uh, um, and luckily, uh, um, nowadays we're advancing a lot in the detection system of the Raman spectrometer. So which means they are becoming very sensitive and therefore stuff you couldn't see before, now we can uh, um, also more powerful objective, powerful lasers, or uh, different lasers with different power and different energies and so on. So I think it's a nice approach, very versatile, very powerful to continue learning from um, uh, materials that are Raman active. So metal oxides are really Raman active, but not all of them. Uh, so it's, it's important uh, to realize that. But also I want to, to finalize the catalyst, the activation part, which is also very neat because what you surely know is that Raman is very good technique to, character, to characterize carbonaceous, carbonaceous species. And a lot of people use it to study nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, to distinguish between, for instance, two-dimensional and three-dimensional carbon or graphitic and amorphous carbon. And when, you do, when we do catalysis, especially with hydrocarbons at high temperature, we have a challenge with the activation of the catalyst due to carbon deposition. So I have data where um, um, we can determine how carbon deposition take place on the catalyst and using the same approach by pulsing hydrocarbons, which means you can pulse the growth of carbonaceous species on the surface. We can quantitatively determine the rate of the activation. And also you can burn this carbon by using pulses of oxygen. And then you can determine the quantitatively the rate of uh, regeneration of your catalyst using Raman spectrokinetics. So just, just, just to highlight at the end. Um, so that being said, I think this is what I have for today, Lorraine and everybody. And so thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrillo. That was an excellent lecture. Um, we have several questions for you. Firstly, from the aspect of surface processes, what is the difference between in-situ technique and operando technique? Or is in situ and operando, are they just different parameters? Yeah, I mean, um, how to say, in, operando needs the in situ approach. Let's put it that way. In situ, what allows you is to uh, use the same condition that you use for the, 
for, an ex for a conventional experiment. Let's suppose you need high temperature. In situ allows you to put exactly the same temperature that you need for the reaction, for instance. In situ is a way that you can tune the parameters to see how those parameters influences the structure of your catalyst using Raman spectroscopy. Whereas operando, you couple the analytics that allows you to determine rates and therefore the conversion or transformation of reactant into products at the same time. So what it means you have the in situ part allows you the conditions, you have the operando part, which is the analytics together with in situ, which means you can connect in real time the transformation of your, of your solid or your catalyst with the, with, the, with the reactivity. So your structure change, reactivity go up or go down, and, and then you can link easier, rather than have the gap on taking your sample out and going to the reactor, so some people do some processes that they call passivation. So they passivate the system. Mm -hmm. So they slightly oxidize the surface to put it out, bring it to the reactor and, and, and so on. So the operando approach allows you to, at the same time, measure change in the structure or determine the change in the structure of your catalyst and change and measure the change of concentration of reactants as a function of time. Awesome, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are the considerations to be taken when analyzing a sample that has organic matter remnants? Since on one hand, it could be beneficial due to surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, but it also favors the burning of the sample. Yes, yes, this is a very good question. So let me, let me highlight something with the enhanced Raman spectroscopy, which is very nice now for the Raman spectrokinetics. At the beginning, I didn't want to use enhanced Raman spectroscopy because you use a dopant to do that, normally iron or gold. And, and, and if you're doing C2 or you want to measure rates, those species now are going to participate in the reaction as well, most probably. So what it means is, is, is tricky, right? To see how realistic or accurate your rate is. But now a lot of uh, authors has come with a very nice approach where they encapsulate the gold particles or the iron particles to promote the Raman vibrations. Therefore, they might be silent for the reaction, and therefore you might be now able to run Raman spectrokinetics on interactions between organic matter with sites. I mean, more to, to, to see vibrations that I cannot see so far with this approach without enhancing, let's put it that way. So yes, uh, uh, it's possible to do. I have not done it, but I don't see why it's not possible. Awesome. As soon as, sorry to interrupt you, as soon as, you follow the approach of the encapsulation because the rate you get is going to be more realistic. This is important mm -hmm. to highlight. Thank you. What would be the limit of detection in terms of reaction rates for an in-situ and operando uh, Raman spectroscopy? Could it also be used for very fast reactions? Very, yeah, very good question. Um, this is a limitation, right? Mm -hmm. I would say. When I say, when I said during the talk that we define Raman spectrokinetic as a time resolve methodology. Mm -hmm. What we are doing is sort of, um, how to say, sort of, um, um, so what we're doing is the following. We need to quantify how many sites we have on our catalyst. And that's why we use these materials because we know a lot about these materials. So we know how many sites you have. By, let's suppose you have 10 sites. What we did was how many moles of reactants you need, for example, to oxidize, for instance, how, many, how much oxygen do you need or how many moles do you need of oxygen to oxidize these 10 moles of, of, of sites? Let's suppose you need 10 moles. What the quenching or the transient, the transient kinetics allows me to do is that these 10 moles, I divided by 10 pulses. So I made 10 pulses to reach the total oxidation of my system. So when I pulse only one mole of oxygen from the 10 sites, only one might be oxidized. You will have nine still available, mm -hmm. right? But when you pulse, there is no more oxygen passing through, which means the reaction stop. So you are measuring the oxidation of one site. And because now is no more oxygen passing through, if you need five days to take a spectra, in theory, it doesn't matter because the reaction already occurred. So you're measuring the rate of this reaction, and then you measure the second, the third, and that's what we do is we put all together. I don't know if it was clear. This, yeah. is, a, this is a trick, let's put it in the way, behind the Raman spectrokinetics. 
That makes sense. Um, let's see. Have you studied the effect of Raman laser on the catalytic process at all? Very good. Very good question. Um, so for this react for the oxidation, yes, not for all the ones mm -hmm. yet. But um, so most of the hydro, so most at least what I do, most of the reaction that I work with is let's say 600, 700, 500, 800 Celsius degree. Mm -hmm. So um, the amount of energy we put on our system with the laser during the amount of time that we need for the experiment is not enough on energy to overcome. Let's suppose I use 700 Celsius degree. When we do experiments overnight, for instance, you come the next day and the temperature, I mean, it's still the same, right? So which means you are not putting enough energy to heat up further mm -hmm. or above the amount of energy you are putting with your, with your, with your heating device, for instance. Secondly, we determine or we realize that the only issue, at least so far that we have had, with the amount of energy that laser brings is on the structure of the sample itself, not on the reactivity or the reaction. If the if the sample survive the energy from the laser, so which means you don't burn the sample, mm -hmm. um, or we find the optimal conditions, which mean power, uh, a number of scans and so on from the laser, entire of laser to run the experiments. If we find the optimal conditions and the sample doesn't suffer any chain, we, we have not observed any, any issue on that. So we also have two thermocouples at the same time on our systems to, to monitor temperature tanks and so on, and we don't see anything remarkable. Awesome, very good. Yeah. Um, could you comment on where the, we could find more information for your gas mixing system and catalytic chamber? Can you repeat that question, please, again? Uh, could you comment on where we could find more information on the design of your gas mis mixing system and catalytic chamber? Yeah, um, I mean, the point with that is actually, I'm, so we file a patent for that, for the whole approach. Awesome. And this, uh, so the cartoon that I showed you is a cartoon, right? <laughs> it's it's, a, it's a no details on how it is. Mm -hmm. But um, um, how to say, I can, I can give you a secret, it's not a big deal on, on how you can think about it. It's not the total answer, but I copied the idea from EGC. I'm a kinetics person, so mm -hmm. I, I opened GC all my life. So what I did was like took the idea from EGC. This is what I can tell you. <laughs> awesome. Um, last question, could you comment on why you think the support of your catalyst had very, lim uh, very little impact on the reactivity? Because it's a bit, in this specific case, because it's silica. Okay. Ah, okay, no, no, I mean, I think, uh, okay, I got the point, I got the point. Do you mean here? Yes, exactly. I mean here, yeah, but um, this is logarithmic scale. Mm. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's not that different. So for instance, niobium is, is much active than, uh, let's like suppose, silica, right? Right. So, um, yes, the, the, no, there is an impact. There is a support effect. We know that from the conventional kinetics. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the support effect on, on actually for propane ODA, for instance, zirconia, then titanium, followed by alumina, and then the less reactive is silica, for instance. So, um, yes, there is a support effect. We can see it here. Maybe the person who asked didn't realize the, the scale. Now, if he means the, um, as a function of coverage, this also has been reported many times for supporting metal oxides, because when you have two-dimensional species, all sides are very similar. So, and, and therefore they chose, um, or despite of the sides are maybe different, they chose similar reactivity. This is what I want mm -hmm. to say. When you have two dimensional species, the difference between the species when they are two dimensionals are going to be monomer, if they are monomers, which mean mon molecular dispersed, iso uh, isolated a monomer, mm -hmm. or you have dimers, trimers, oligomers. So and oligomers grow, 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 and then you form the monolayer, and then you, boom, get the particles formation. So what it means is really um, challenge to um, distinguish or to quantify, I think actually nobody has done that uh, for mixed for mix systems like this, multi-component systems, to quantify the amount of monomers, oligomers on the surface of supported materials. Mm -hmm. But assuming that you have them, and actually we can, qualitatively say that we have more monomers or less and so on. Mm -hmm. 
seems like all of them, monomers, dimers, trimers, and monomers, they show similar reactivity. Seems, uh, this is what this uh, rate of TOS as a function of coverage, coverage is telling us. Right. Awesome. Thank you. So I'll share um, my closing slides real quick. Thank you so, so much for your excellent lecture for all the time that you've given Dr. Carrero that I really appreciate it and I'm sure many, many other people do as well.